Thank you for joining us today as we take stock of the global commercial real estate performance. My name is Erin Stafford. I'm Managing Director covering various commercial real estate asset classes for DBRS Morningstar. Each year we spend a good deal of time at year end assembling our outlook for the year ahead. And given the volatility that we've experienced thus far in the first quarter of 2023, we thought it might be nice to check in and see how either our views are being confirmed or how they're evolving as we navigate 2023. Today, I'm joined by Chris Chiklis, who will talk to us about the global corporate real estate sector. Then we'll turn to the securitization markets where Steve Jelinek, head of research for North American commercial real estate, will offer his views on North American property performance, followed by Mirko Aya Kabuchi, head of European CMBS, who will give us a view on the European commercial real estate market. And before I turn it over to Chris, I think that you'll hear some common themes throughout, but I wanted to turn your attention to those not familiar with the Bright Talk app. Below the slides, you'll see a comment box where you can submit questions. And it is our hope that we'll be able to get to your questions by the end of the presentation. With that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I suppose I should also thank Aaron for standing in on uh, such short notice. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Um, so as Aaron mentioned, I, I'm Chris Teeklis, Lead Analyst and Senior Vice President in our corporate real estate team at DBRS Morningstar. I joined DBRS in 2017, and I'm based in Toronto. My background is in real estate and corporate finance from a variety of perspectives, including credit, M&A, and valuations. Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, our team covers REITs, REOCs, and pension plan real estate entities globally. Asset classes covered include retail, office, industrial, multifamily, as well as seniors housing and temperature controlled warehousing with portfolios ranging from approximately 100 million in annual EBITDA to over 3 billion. Our current ratings range from double B high to double A. And I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Steve Jelinek. Thanks, Chris. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, again, I'm Steve Jelinek. I head up um, CMBS Research for DBR's Morningstar. And um, it's hard to believe I have coming up on my 35th year in the industry. Uh, as far as our rated universe um, in CMBS, um, we have nearly $560 billion under coverage. Um, most of that is comprised of single asset, single borrower, uh, conduit, agency, and CRE CLO loans. And uh, I'll be getting into those in more detail um, during my portion of the talk. And with that, I will turn it over to Mirko. Hi. Thanks, Steve, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mirko Iacobucci, and uh, Senior Vice President at uh, Head of the European CMBS here at DBRS since 2017. And uh, yes, uh, first of all, I will say, <laughs> I will uh, highlight like the European CMBS market is uh, much smaller compared uh, to the US, as you can see in, in, uh, the, in the slide. We CBR, at DBRS, we cover around 8.5 billion of uh, CMBS, and the market is uh, largely dominated by single asset, single borrower transaction. Uh, the UK is the most prolific uh, uh, market in Europe uh, by far, with more than 50% of the transaction, and followed by Italy and Germany. And the vast majority of our portfolio is composed of uh, logistic uh, uh, transaction, and then office, retail, and hospitality in uh, sequence. Uh, at the moment, there are around 41 loans uh, in the 32 European CMBS transactions that we rated and monitor. And uh, currently there are three loans uh, into special servicing. And now and over to Chris. Thanks, Mirko. Great. Let's dive in. 
um, in terms of an update on our outlook for global corporate real estate. Um, we'll start with issuance and, and just for context, a lot of what I'll be speaking to today will be an update to our 2023 corporate real estate outlook commentary that we published in early February. Um, so again, we'll, we'll start with issuance. You can see how after record bond issuance in 2020 and 2021 by our rated real estate entities, issuance dramatically slowed in 2022 because of um, certainly elevated spreads and all in coupon rates had something to do with that. Um, many issuers decided to take a pause on issuing bonds for their refinancing needs, as well as their, their debt financed growth plans. And what they did for their financing needs is they looked elsewhere, not to equity capital markets, because in many cases, issuing equity was also very expensive, but to alternative sources of capital. And in our minds, alternative sources of capital might include secured loans, such as mortgages, unsecured loans from banks, or selling prized income producing properties, such as multifamily or industrial assets, where possible, either outright or bringing on equity partners. Uh, now, the reason I spent some time describing what happened in 2022 is because those dynamics haven't changed much so far in 2023, and we don't really expect them to until possibly later this year. Hence, why we don't expect a strong bounce back in bond issuance in our rated corporate real estate universe. However, we have had a stronger than expected start to the year, which calls into question our outlook. I think what we're seeing is real estate entities remain committed to the unsecured bond market and have a strong preference to fund with unsecured bonds given the efficiency of execution and flexibility afforded so long as they can make sense of the pricing. And in that regard, um, just while we're on the topic of making sense of pricing, uh, mitigating the impact of higher rates somewhat um, in our corporate real estate universe are, are well ladder debt maturities and fixed rate debts. Uh, moving on to our outlook for ratings in our sector, um, we maintain a modestly negative outlook. While most sectors recovered from the pandemic and ratings are better positioned within their respective rating categories, mounting headwinds point to increasing credit risk. Some of the prominent risks, no doubt, include elevated inflation and interest rates and increasing odds of recession, which together can sound daunting. However, mitigating the credit impact somewhat are a few considerations for each of the aforementioned risks, um, some of which we've published commentaries on uh, relatively recently in the last few months, but I'll, I'll just recap uh, briefly here. Starting with inflation, many lease agreements have some form of rental rate escalator, either as fixed percentage increases or linked to an inflation index. There are also mark to market opportunities on new leases. On the expense side, the landlord is often not responsible for all of the operating expenses by way of net leases, particularly for triple net leases where the tenant pays all of the operating costs, including property taxes, insurance, and maintenance. We touched on mitigants to interest rate risk earlier, such as a well laddered debt maturity profile and fixed rates. In a recessionary environment, Long-term leases with high-quality credit, tenant, credit tenants matters more than ever. And with that sort of high-level background, we can dive into our ratings outlook by the various real estate sectors. We'll progress through the sectors from stable outlook to negative. Our outlook on industrial is stable. Industrial portfolios that we rate are demonstrating high and stable occupancy rates and continue to report sizable positive spreads between current in-place rents and market rents, implying cash flow stability and downside protection in the event of a slowdown. These fundamentals are supported by favorable secular trends that haven't gone away, and I'm sure they sound familiar to many of our attendees today, such as 
e-commerce, onshoring, and just-in-case inventory. As with the broader industrial market, we have a stable outlook on temperature control warehousing, which given its more labor intensive nature is more exposed to inflation risks. However, leading operators have demonstrated an ability to raise rates to at least keep pace with expense inflation, though sometimes at a lag. We similarly have a stable outlook on multifamily assets in portfolios that we rate which are generally located in strong markets with favorable demographic tailwinds. While we anticipate rent growth will moderate, long-term fundamentals remain supportive of credit quality in the sector, including population growth, limited supply, and lack of housing affordability. Perhaps I'll just comment briefly here on our negative outlook for seniors housing, which I think is more of an idiosyncrasy of our coverage universe with elevated leverage which you can see here on the on the slide, notwithstanding the improving operating environment following the pandemic and favorable long-term demographic tailwinds. Moving on to retail, interestingly, we have a stable outlook on retail as fundamentals have firmed up following the COVID pandemic. Stronger fundamentals are driven by lack of net new supply following years of converting excess supply or obsolete assets into alternate uses Affirmation of bricks and mortar retail through omni-channel retail strategies, in other words, clicks to bricks, and a stronger tenant base resulting from more focus on curating the right mix, which might include more necessity-based retail exposure. And that leaves us with our negative outlook on office. Some are characterizing the office sector as the new retail, which I don't think is entirely unfounded. Headwinds facing the office sector echo retail years ago with oversupply and obsolescence of older, less desirable assets in need of capital, while in the midst of a dramatic shift in work, working habits, um, a more flexible work environment. In other words, replace e-commerce with e-work, add high leverage, mounting recessionary fears with tech layoffs, banking instability, and it's not hard to see why risks are weighted to the downside. There are, however, mitigants to credit risks for our rated office portfolios. In the near term, long leases, quality tenants, and a flight to quality of tenants to newer, more desirable, well-amenitized assets should support cash flow stability of our issuers. In the longer term, fewer new construction starts today points to tempered supply growth that's helping to bring supply and demand more into balance. The last 12 months have no doubt been challenging for real estate entities as they've had to contend with high inflation, interest rates, and recession fears in quick succession. Elevated cost of capital, low transaction volumes, and lagging valuations has caused many real estate entities to temper execution of their strategies, be it acquisitions or capital recycling initiatives. In terms of where we think there might be some activity in 2023, the ongoing dislocation in capital markets, in other words, high cost of capital, seems to point to continued shareholder activism, strategic reviews and restructurings as issuers and their investors aim to close the gap in estimated net asset values and unit prices. From a credit perspective, significant change can potentially increase uncertainty and risk and thereby increase downward rating pressure. On the other hand, such dislocation in capital markets can create selective opportunities for relatively low cost capital so long as there are ready sellers of attractive assets such as well-located, high-quality industrial and multifamily properties. Depending on the method of financing, high-quality acquisitions can be credit accretive. We view the current dislocation in capital markets as temporary and anticipate real estate entities will resume transactional activity when the spread between cost of capital and valuations normalizes. And with that, 
I'll turn it over to Steve to talk about our outlook for the North American CMBS market. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And again, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, so the, everybody knows basically the market context we're dealing with now. We have market turbulence, rising interest rates, and slowing growth. Um, and how that's going to affect our outlook for CMBS um, is what I'm going to talk about. So um, I'm going to start out with a new issue, um, talk a little bit about um, high-level performance summary. Um, then I'll delve into our individual property markets, talk a little bit about maturing loans, and finishing up with our outlook for rating activity for the year. So um, jumping into new issue. The slowdown that began in 2022 is definitely pers persisting into 2023. Uh, the CMBS market has all but dried up. As you can see on the slide, um, roughly only $5 billion um, in CMBS has been issued uh, during the first quarter of 2023, a mere fraction of what was issued um, during the first quarter of 2022. And that's CMBS. If we include, if we look at CRE CLO, it's the same picture. Um, a little over a billion in CRE CLO so far, uh, compared to over 15 billion in 1Q 2022. So what's driving the uh, declining um, volumes? So the increase in volatility and risk premiums and CMBX makes it harder for um, CMBS loans and hedges against interest rates and credit risks. So there's no way to confidently hedge your CMBS lending and to lock in a profit. And another interesting point is the banks aren't in the mood to put more risk on the balance sheet. So they're basically squirreling away their deposits um, because they're dealing with um, liquidity pressure that um, reared its head over the past few weeks in the banking sector. Um, that loss of banking confidence has also led to more uncertainty in counterparties. Um, there's also concerns about um, declining valuations, and the Fed's not out of the woods on taming inflation. And lastly, the higher cost of capital means lower property values as well. So taking a look at performance summary, um, next two charts, uh, first one covers delinquency um, in total and by property type, and the second one that I'll skip to in a second um, covers uh, special servicing. So when we issued our outlook uh, in um, early 23 for the year, um, we basically were looking at much of the real estate market was bracing prior delinquency rates um, because the aforementioned turbulence, rising interest rates, and slowing growth. Um, and prior to February, the, the delinquency rate had actually posted just four rare upticks over the past 31 months. But February's results finally saw those expectations come to fruition as the CMBS delinquency rate moves sharply higher. It jumped 24 basis points to 3.07%, which is the largest monthly increase since the summer of 2020. Similarly, the special servicing rate has risen slowly since July um, when it fell to post-pandemic low of 4.99%. Okay, so with that as a little bit of context for what we're seeing right now, I'm going to jump into um, the office, the um, property sectors. I'm going to start off with office, which is, in short, top of everybody's mind and what <clears throat> most people are probably losing sleep about. So in January, in our outlook, we noted that office loan delinquencies and distressed loan transfers to special servicing were pretty much subdued, um, but the potential for distress was rising. We were worried about tech layoffs and giving back space and slow return to office. <clears throat> so skip ahead a couple months, and we can see the office sector distress is on the rise. Um, as I mentioned, it posted the largest monthly and annual increases in both delinquent and special servicing rates. So um, we were concerned about tech layoffs. Now we're concerned about bank layoffs and banks giving back space. Um, we also have been and will continue to be focused on corporate cost cutting that's reducing office space demand and companies are still in the early days, we believe, of their hybrid work experiments. 
um, putting pressure on, on office occupancy, which will likely lead to further increases in delinquencies for the sector. Um, last year, uh, office absorption actually eked out a 0.1% gain following two years of negative absorption, according to CBRE. The overall vacancy rate for office um, continues to go in the wrong direction. It rose 30 basis points to 17.3% in Q4, which is actually 40 basis points higher than the peak um, during the great financial crisis, and that peak was 16.9%. Um, demand obviously has been most affected by the slow reoccupancy of office space and widespread virtual working trends. The near-term supply pipeline is actually pretty robust, but the construction pipeline is heavily Class A, and it'll support the continued flight to quality. The intensifying flight to quality will allow the prime assets to act as better hedges against persistent inflation as the strong demand for top quality product pushes pricing towards landlords. Qualities of the top office properties are those built post-2010 following those between, built between 2000 and 2009. So the office supply is predominantly concentrated in 1980s vintage, which doesn't offer the amenities and space for quality for modern office users. And the offices and mixed-use developments are actually pretty successful where people can live, work, and shop. Most developments are in locations with those kind of nearby attractions. The downside risks to office include continued inflation, uh, weakening economy and, continue, and weakening in the labor markets, and wide adoption of hybrid work. <clears throat> and lastly, with regard to office, maturing loans are in the hot seat. Um, lenders have become increasingly wary of financing older office buildings and those with more than minimal tenant lease expirations. About $7 billion in office loans mature through the rest of 2023 and roughly 40% in our estimation will have difficulty refinancing in a best case scenario. And in a worst case scenario, 60% will have trouble. <clears throat> okay, pivoting to hotels. Um, lodging is actually, um, lodging demand is actually on firm footing, um, though growth has flattened out versus uh, 2019. In 2022, um, we actually saw the fastest post-contraction recovery in, in lodging. Um, most markets have now recovered. Um, national REFPAR growth reached an all-time high, and property-level gross operating profit also set new highs, up 62% year over year, and up 4.8% compared with 2019. Uh, because of this, hotel delinquencies have steadily fallen, um, and they actually touched a 30 four month low of 4.21% in February, after hitting a high of nearly 24% in the summer of 2020. Similarly, the hotel special service rate reached a low of 6.8% in February after spiking to a high of more than 26% in September of 2020. So what's re re um, fueling the, the recovery in demand? Well, we have excess savings, we have pent up business travel, and um, we're also looking at accelerating inbound international visitation. Uh, as far as subsectors, resorts and leisure destinations continue to lead in the recovery as increases in work flexibility and higher wages fuel growth. Uh, six of the top 10 markets uh, were in the Southeast in terms of uh, 2022 rev par versus 2019. And uh, within the Southeast region, Tampa posted the largest rev par gain. Uh, hotels located in CBDs are still lagging a little bit. They're improving, but uh, they're not forecast to fully recover until 2024. Uh, in terms of risks for lodging, uh, they include rising operating expenses as inflation persists and deteriorating economy as the pace of gains is slowing versus 2019. Okay, pivoting to retail. So following a strong rebound coming out of the pandemic, our stable outlook on retail hasn't changed, um, which is buoyed by the high construction costs and tight availability. Even as high inflation, rising interest rates, and labor shortages hit records, suggesting a high risk of a recession during the first half of the year, historically low development levels will buoy retail's continued recovery. The sector has also seen low, um, new deliveries as the percentage of retail inventory decline for five consecutive years. The vacancy rate um, continues to fall as asking rents rise. 
Uh, the vacancy rate for neighborhood community and strip centers fell to an all-time low of 6.9% in the fourth quarter, as shopping center rents are expected to continue to rise around 3% per year over the next five years. Um, in terms of tenants, uh, retailers and properties that weathered the last three years have proven their resilience. Um, these retailers are continuing to expand for the second consecutive year as more stores opened and closed in 2022. Definitely a bright spot. For example, big box retailers like um, Barnes & Noble, Burlington, Ross, TJX have all added stores with plans for more additions this year. A particular challenge in retail that we're keeping an eye on is high street retail and central business district mixed retail mixed use um, that continue to struggle, particularly in New York City. Uh, these properties might continue to struggle if inflation has a negative effect on travel or if the return to office movement continues to be low. Um, we're also keeping an eye on class B and C malls that remain deeply challenged as well. And we expect this to continue to see owners of struggling malls and centers convert their properties to mixed use developments. Switching over to industrial, um, industrial has been pretty resilient throughout the pandemic. Um, despite a decline in demand and broader economic volatility, um, we expect the industrial sector um, to remain resilient. Um, supporting the, its resiliency is expanding domestic supply chain from rising import levels and tight vacancy rates. The sustained growth in e-commerce will continue to bolster the need for logistics and distribution facilities. Um, since e-commerce's uh, e share of total retail sales since peaking in 2020 will regain its momentum despite the recent return of in-store shopping because shoppers prefer the convenience and choice of shopping online. As, as a result, tenants will seek out markets with strong population growth and available infill locations to build their e-commerce supply chains that will accommodate faster delivery times. Uh, we see new industrial opportunities emerging as well as manufacturers focus on bringing production lines on U.S. soil and reduce their resilience on, on imported good, goods. Uh, some of the risks we're looking at in industrial are aging inventory. Um, the modern space requirements are going to drive demand. Um, space needs continue to evolve and occupier, occupiers are, will continue to pay a premium for buildings with higher ceilings. Um, also, uncertainty in the macro economy um, may slow leasing activity as well. Switching over to multifamily. Um, so, basic question in my mind is, is multifamily demand finally normalizing after um, a huge run up um, during COVID? Um, vacancy was 4.6% in Q4 which actually rose 70 basis points year over year. So is that um, an inflection point? Um, we'll have to wait for future quarters, but um, it could point to a normalizing demand. Um, new deliveries have been surging. Um, nearly 100,000 units were delivered in the fourth quarter, which is a new record, a sign that completions that were delayed during COVID are being delivered with increasing speed, keeping the new supply at peak levels. The challenging for sale market is also cropping up demand for multifamily rentals as home prices and mortgage rates have skyrocketed. The growing share of households is priced out of the, the for sale market as well. Next slide, I'm gonna to pivot to maturing loans. This is a study we did late last year on maturing loans and we took a look at it by um, property sector as well as total. And we looked at three categories um, that we, um, as variables for whether or not loan will refinance. Um, so basically what I wanna draw out of this slide is that increasing refinance pressure is definitely there and it's, it's in the coming months. Um, we have slightly more than 28 billion of CMS debt that's scheduled to mature in 2023 with office and hotel under the most pressure. Um, as far as office, lenders have become increasingly wary of financing uh, the older office buildings, as I alluded to earlier, and those with more than minimal tenant lease expirations. 
Last thing I wanted to discuss is rating activity. So we expect upgrades to moderate this year, given the forecast on rent growth slowing. Um, the wild card would be the effect of the seasons on upgrades. The seasons is very cheap right now, and, but in order to see greater defeasance, actual property sales will need to increase. Uh, defeasance driven by increased values and the refinance may not be a strong enough option at this point for borrowers given that cost of debt has increased significantly. Downgrades are likely to keep pace so long as the delinquency remains low and maturity date extensions remain the preferred method to deal with loans that are facing difficulty refinancing. So that covers um, CMBS, and with, I'm going to turn it over to Marco. Thanks, Steve, and uh, and you know again, thanks for um, attending this uh, webinar. And uh, to be honest, uh, in Europe, in the commercial estate sector in Europe, we have a, a, a picture which is similar to you know what you have seen in the US. Uh, the sector in general, and of course, uh, consequently, the European uh, CMBS sector is feeling is feeling similar pressure as we have uh, in increasing inflation, uh, putting pressure on household income. We have most of the largest economy in Europe uh, struggling for growth, and actually a uh, few of them, uh, they are also expected to, uh, to have a recession this year. And uh, of course, we have uh, uh, an increasing interest rate environment, which is putting pressure, up, uh, downward pressure on uh, upward pressure on property yields and subsequently downward pressures on valuation. The results of all these uh, weaknesses and structural changes are that uh, European banks in general, they are adopting a much more cautious, cautious approach when they're underwriting commercial real estate loan. And uh, actually for uh, some of the assets, like uh, some of the loans secured by retail and office assets, the liquidity is actually reduced and and is actually creating a, a significant liquidity gap for these two asset type. These this problematics, these issues clearly are felt as well in, uh, in, in our small European CMBS world, as we have more loans now uh, having an increasing probability to default, and some of them uh, are expected to be transferred to special servicing, as uh, actually uh, we have uh, a quite significant number of uh, European CMBS, which are, are going to mature this year or next year. And, uh, uh, and, and as a result, you know, uh, following under significant uh, um, refinancing pressure. And actually most of these loans, uh, or let's say uh, significant numbers of the loan, these loans are uh, secured by the two asset types that I mentioned before, retail and office, which at the moment uh, are uh, really unpopular both with you know with banks and investors in general. So for this loan, actually, uh, our expectations are that uh, potentially we could also see uh, losses for some of the junior tranches. If we move and we look at more specifically to the main five asset types that you know we have uh, in our portfolio, we have a negative outlook for two of them and. So no surprising, it's uh, uh, are the, the office and the retail sector. For the office sector, what we see is a two-speed market uh, with prime and uh, green certified uh, office building that actually are benefiting from low vacancy and higher rents as companies this, uh, keep uh, um, uh, focusing on buildings that are ESG compliant and uh, and uh, they actually only really look at this kind of uh, properties when they look for new office space. On the other side, secondary office uh, property are instead struggling and uh, they are really feeling uh, the negative impact or companies reducing their space uh, needs and uh, cutting basically uh, what they think is an efficient space. Here it's also, I think, worth to highlight the fact that uh, for some of this secondary office space, also potential refurbishment um, that you know will bring the, the, the standard of the property to uh, ESG uh, compliant 
it's likely to be uh, unsuccessful uh, as the cost for redeveloping this property would be probably much higher uh, compared to what uh, you know the landlord could, have, could achieve in terms of rents when the property are uh, are completed and fully refurbished. And if we move to the retail sector, well, the retail sector is once again under pressure. Has been under pressure for now quite a few years. Uh, first, you know, they, they 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 were hit by the competition from e-commerce. Then there was, you know, the you know the lock the lockdown uh, caused by the pandemics. And now there is, you know, higher interest rates, falling real household, household incomes. And also here in Europe, the, 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 there is the, the, the significant negative impact of, of the war in Ukraine, which are all negative impacting consumer confidence. And it's in this context, it, it is uh, quite easy to expect and to predict that we will see more uh, tenants default. And also we, we will see probably uh, rents to keep decline further. And also, as we see here, uh, quite clearly, the, the component of turnover becomes uh, more and more important com compared to the fixing, you know, fixed parts of, of rent. And uh, and today, uh, it's uh, analyzing this asset class in, uh, in Europe. I think it will be impossible if you don't consider the the impact of turnover rent on the on you know on those property. Instead, if we move to Let's say a more positive picture. We we at the moment have a stable outlook for the logistic, the residential, and the hospitality sector. The logistic sector is also feeling some pressure from you know uh, recession or economic uncertainty. But so far we we keep seeing strong demand for logistic space, and we keep seeing continual rental growth. Uh, and we would expect that this rental growth might offset the, the impact of uh, widening health. And uh, as a result, keeping the, the, the value of this asset uh, stable uh, and despite the, the, the surrounding uh, difficulties. Also, the residential sector, the fundamentals of the residential sector remain quite strong. Uh, in particular, the, the sector is benefiting from uh, the rise in interest uh, in mortgage rates and uh, other problems in the mortgage housing market, which basically make the uh, renting the increasing preferred option for uh, for people. And uh, and we keep you know uh, we keep seeing in the transaction that we rate uh, rental income actually growing at sometimes a double digit number. And then we move, if we move to the hospitality sector, that's, that has been actually, uh, I would say, a positive story uh, all across 2022, as you know, the reopening following the, the end of the lockdown measure across all Europe have seen a rebound in, uh, in the touristic you know, market and uh, an increase uh, or in general, people traveling for business or pleasure. And uh, we are actually, from the transaction that we, we rate we have seen occupancy level uh, almost close to pre-pandemic level. And actually we have seen uh, an increase, a significant increase in ADR number for all the deals that we rate. So um, for this sector as well, our actually, our actually is actually is stable and we, we think that you know, the, the rebound will continue in 2023. Now, if we move, uh, to the European CMBS sector specifically, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I have to say the, the, the European CMBS market has confirmed no, the reputation to be uh, the most volatile asset class the year in Europe, uh, as is the first one to disappear when there is uncertainty, and it's the last one uh, to come back. This, the European structural finance market actually restarted uh, uh, really strong in the first couple of months of 2023. And where we, we saw uh, finally um, spreads for ABS and RMBS transaction uh, tightly significantly in uh, in those months, uh, and there were signs that finally this trend was uh, moving towards the CMBS sector as well. 
However, <laughs> the recent problems and uh, issues with the uh, you know with the banks across the globe has once again uh, uh, impacted negatively the market, which at the moment has significantly slowed down, and once again probably uh, put on hold uh, a potential comeback of, of the European CMBS uh, uh, sector. However, we want to keep our initial no forecast for uh, a reopening of, of this market. So we still think that uh, in the second quarter of 2023, there might be uh, new issues for for the European CMBS sector. However, uh, our general expectation for new transactions in 2023 is still quite limited. It's, we would expect 2.5 uh, to maximum 3 billion uh, of, uh, of new CMBS, probably six or seven transactions, which is far away from uh, where the market was in 2021, uh, where we had uh, uh, more than 15 transactions rated, publicly uh, distributed, and over you know seven billion of uh, of CMBS uh, uh, plays. We might also expect uh, that has you know investors uh, looking for yield, uh, more alternative asset types could actually uh, be securitized in the CMBS transaction. In particular, uh, we won't be surprised to see uh, CMBS secured maybe by data centers or cold storage or self storage or nursery home. As I was mentioning before, uh, the European CMBS sector is expecting a couple of, you know, uh, I would say challenging years, as uh, more than half of the transaction of spending will facing, you know, refinancing pressure. And um, and as I said, we we would expect that for the transaction secured by um, office and retail properties, this uh, refinancing risk is actually. Uh, is going to probably materialize in some cases in uh, uh, loan defaulting and so be unable to repay at the expected maturity and probably transferring uh, been transferring to special servicing also what we are seeing so far is that uh, in general uh, sponsors even the one that uh, they have uh, loan secured by a more stable asset class like for example logistic or residential they they still uh, try to exercise extension options if they have, uh, if they have the extension options in their facility agreements, or instead, if they have already uh, reached the final maturity of the loan, they try to uh, agree uh, extensions with the service and not holders, uh, expecting for uh, stabilization of the market uh, as well as uh, you know uh, rates in the in the market. Um, I would actually probably like to, you know, conclude with a positive note. We in 2022 uh, we have seen quite a lot of revaluation um, of, you know, the assets in our portfolio. And to be honest, the trend back what we said uh, before when we described the main uh, five uh, property types in our portfolio, as we saw logistic asset keep growing in terms of you know value uh, as well as a residential and hospitality and hospitality asset we have also seen a, a rebound for example of the retail sector but here uh, we are still the valuation are still well below where they used to be before uh, the pandemic and uh, with this i hand over back to harry Thank you, Mirko. Um, just wanted to remind everybody that there are there's a the ability to ask questions is right below the slides in the question box. Um, we have a handful that we'll get through in a minute, and then also just one um, uh, housekeeping note that um, we will be sending these slides around um, to everyone who's attended, so um, you'll get that uh, via email. Um, Steve, we have a question just on one of your slides as, as it relates to the percent of property type delinquency. If you want to give that a explanation, that'd be great.
Steve, you may be on mute. Sorry about that. Um, the question came out, what do these percentages actually mean? <clears throat> so if you think about it, just in plain um, math, the denominator <clears throat> is the total balance of um, loans of, in the particular sector, and the numerator is the total balance of loans that are delinquent. So for example, I'm um, just pulling up the numbers right now, um, total balance of loans that are delinquent is um, a little over $18 billion, and the total universe is 500 and almost $592 billion. So one divided the, by the other is 3.07%. And the same would be true for the individual um, property sectors. It's the total balance within that sector that's delinquent um, divided by the total outstanding balance within that sector. Thanks, Steve. Um, question, Chris, we'll bring you back into the conversation. Um, I think the one interesting thing, obviously we've been talking a lot about rising interest rates, but that also likely comes with rising cap rates. What do you think the overall cr impact is to credit, um, given the fact that we're likely to see rising cap rates? Sure, uh, thanks, Aaron. Um, I suppose there are a few angles to tackle that one um, there's a lot of nuance as always uh, maybe I'll start with kind of our methodology um, a loan to value type metric is not a primary financial risk metric in our methodology um, we're more cash focused however portfolio values do come into consideration when we assess the unencumbered asset pool our methodology assumes real estate entities generally have a high proportion of property specific mortgage debt in the capital stack uh, to the extent they have a low proportion of secured debt relative to total debt and therefore an unencumbered balance sheet. We may view that as a material credit positive that warrants uplift to the rating. In arriving at that conclusion, we'll look at, among other things, the amount of coverage the unencumbered asset pool provides over the unsecured debt, which in our ratings universe is typically two to three times, um, which includes underlying capacity on their unsecured revolving credit facilities. Um, I guess there are a variety of other potential implications um, some examples that come to mind are, one, um, lower valuations could make capital recycling initiatives uh, less compelling as an alternative source of capital, causing issuers to source capital elsewhere, um, which could have its own credit implications. And on the other hand, uh, focus could return to acquisitions as a preferred way to grow um, versus development, uh, which could separately have its own credit implications. And when I say could have credit implications, I mean that it depends on sources and uses of capital, ancillary risks, and so on. Um, there are a lot of moving parts. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, Mirka, I think you kind of touched on this as it relates to refinancing prospects as we go into the rest of 2023, 2024, um, with regard to the, the securitization book that may be up against maturity. Um, what are you seeing there again? And, and is it property specific in terms of your outlook? Yeah. As I said, it's, uh, the, the challenge for OPS MBS in the next couple of years is huge uh, as a, uh, a big number of, of loans uh, gets to maturity. And uh, also recently there's been the case of uh, a Blackstone sponsor transaction, which uh, was unable to actually sec uh, secure an extension of the loan and, uh, and, and as a result uh, was transferring to special services. And this was the first uh, uh, transaction sponsored actually that by Blackstone, we don't, didn't, uh, they actually defaulted. And, and this for the European CMBS market is actually quite relevant uh, uh, news as 
the, the vast majority of the transaction here in Europe at, at the Blackstone as a sponsor. So the, what we see there is that uh, most of the loans will try to extend, to try to find uh, uh, agreement with, uh, with service and, and not holders uh, to extend uh, the maturity of the transaction. Um, clearly, there was going to be something in exchange for not holders. Probably, you know, you would expect increase in uh, margins of the loans. You will expect some prepayment. You would expect uh, uh, agreed disposal plan. Uh, but uh, the the story is that for each loan, there will be probably a different outcome. And uh, we will need to see case by case. But uh, I think here in Europe, uh, one of the, you know, uh, of the lessons that, you know, we learned from the the great financial crisis is that uh, we, GMBS, as they call 2.0 here in Europe, they now have a much longer tail period, uh, which is the time now between the final maturity of the loan and the, uh, the, the final maturity of the notes. As a result, there is more time to work out the loan and, and try to avoid loss. Uh, when instead, uh, before the crisis, uh, the, these tail periods actually were quite short, uh, some of them only two years. And as a result, they were putting a lot of pressure on the, 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 the refinancing and the restructuring of this loan. So I, I think that uh, um, the, 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 the next two years are going to be challenging. But also the, the, the new CNPS 2.0 in Europe, they have the, the tools to hopefully, hopefully minimize the losses and uh, as I said, uh, um, be refinanced uh, uh, in, in the next months. Thanks, Marco. Um, okay, so it looks like we might have time for one or two more. Um, one of the questions that just came in was, you know, asking about, um, and we're on Steve's delinquency chart by property type, how that compares to uh, when the loans were underwritten. Um, obviously, the delinquencies right now are still elevated with hotel and retail property types um, coming off the pandemic, where those particular property types were uh, greatly impacted, but they have rebounded um, a lot since then, and with, with retail still remaining the most elevated, as, as Steve spoke to. Um, I will note that, you know, in terms of, like, ratings and performance and, and how we um, develop our methodologies that, you know, we looked at uh, loan performance through the great financial crisis in which the delinquency rates were far in excess of where they are today. Um, so that gives us some comfort that they are still low relative to um, the methodology and, and the model and, and how the ratings should perform uh, with that. But it is something that we're obviously watching as, as we talk about with, you know, office having a, a significant increase in the last month that, that, that Steve touched on. Um, so again, something that we're still taking a look at pretty closely, but, um, you know, relative to methodology development and um, great financial crisis, they remain lower. Um, all right, I think what we could end on, Steve, in just in terms of, you know, you kind of touched on it in the beginning as it relates to um, volume expectations with some of the volatility that we saw in Q1. Have you updated or changed your volume expectations um, for the rest of 2023, considering um, some of the headwinds the market faces? Uh, we really haven't changed our expectations a whole lot. Um, we were actually at the low end of market participants in expectations going into the year. Um, we were projecting a 35% decline. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong number. Give me one second. Um, so going into the year, um, yeah, we um, we projected a 31% decline in new issue um, to about $84 billion, which, as I said, was at the low end of most forecasters. Um, and that's pretty much where we are right now. Um, we do expect um, a slight pickup in the second half of the year um, as interest rates hopefully um, stabilize 
we are projecting, or Morningstar is projecting um, the Fed to um, deliver one or two more uh, quarter, ba- uh, quarter of a point increases um, and then hold for the rest of the year. So with that said, a 31% decline in new issue to about $84 billion for 2023 um, by property or by product type about that equates to roughly 15 billion dollars in conduit issuance down from 22 billion in 22 30 billion in SASB down from 43 billion about 15 billion in CLL transactions um, more than half or a little yeah a little more than half of um, the 32 billion from uh, last year and uh, Freddie Mac um, actually continuing to be stable at about $24 billion. But it is, you know, one of, one of the big unknowns. This is definitely a year of unknowns. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Mirko. Appreciate your insights today. Again, if anyone has any um, follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to any one of the panelists, we'd be happy to help and look for the slides to be circulated. We appreciate uh, your participation today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.